What's going on everyone? We're just gonna get straight into it. Today's video is all about how to use Anki outside of medicine. Specifically, we're gonna focus on five tips to utilize Anki for math, okay? And I know you may think Anki is not useful for math. I personally used to think that, but I have used it some, for some math intensive courses in business school and I found it to be quite useful. So I'm gonna go over some tips. Um, if you find this video useful uh, for the math section, I may also then do it for other subjects outside of medicine, such as qualitatively intense courses, such as English, because I do think memory retention is imperative in every field of study. I just don't think it's emphasized or done appropriately. And so hopefully if you find this useful, let me know in the comments below and we can do it for other courses like marketing or, or other qualitative heavy courses. So with that being said, uh, today we're focusing on math. So in math, the flashcards that you make are different because math is a different thing in terms of memory. You don't memorize like five plus five. To a certain extent you do, but the thing you actually do memorize in math are the fundamental concepts. So what you're going to see is, I'm obviously going to give you examples today, but do not obviously do physical math problems with flashcards. Don't like write out a whole problem and do it. Instead, use your flashcards to build a very robust foundation. And with that, you will be able to then do better in your math classes because your foundation will be really robust. And I'll give you some great tips for how to do that today. The fundamentals of making flashcards will not change. So if you haven't watched any of my other Anki videos, um, the fundamentals of flashcards are that you always make flashcards in a question and answer format usually, and you have a very short question and a very short answer to cater to your own personal memory, uh, just so you can go through it quickly. So with that being said, I'm gonna now just go straight into some examples, and these examples are gonna be from math intensive courses in business school. The examples I'm going to show you today are going to actually be from economics and also from some of my investing classes and the way we're learning investing. But much of what I'm telling you can be applied to any math class you're taking, such as calculus, uh, pre-algebra, whatever it is that you're studying. So with that being said, let's just go ahead with the first tip. The first tip is definitions are the foundations of math. Definitions are the foundation of everything, but more so in math. You really need to know how things are defined for you to do math appropriately, and that applies to any field that comes out of math. So for economics, for example, uh, we have certain concepts we need to learn. So you may learn concepts like what is reservation price? What is demand? What is elasticity of demand? What does cross price elasticity mean? Um, similarly, in calculus, you may be asked, what does like what is the derivative of acceleration? What does derivative even mean? What does integral mean? By knowing these definitions cold, you really create such a robust foundation that you'll be able to do things super well. Like to this day, I still remember the chain rule, the product rule, all these random definitions, I still remember them because I like memorized them, right? And I know for a lot of math intensive courses, memory is not a big uh, emphasis because they sometimes give you the formula. But sometimes when you have definitions down like this, what is the reservation price? The reservation price is the price that I'm willing to pay for a good. And right underneath, you see that I actually even included an example and some lecture slide material. So by having definitions like this down cold, I remember when I was actually taking the final for this class, uh, I actually could refer to the definition when I was answering a much more convoluted problem. So they were obviously asking for, you know, maybe the price of something. And I was saying the price is um, obviously where the supply and demand curves intersect. And that's usually uh, defined as like someone's reservation price, which is the price that someone is willing to pay for a good, right? And so by having these definitions cold, you actually solidify your understanding and uh, make your answers more robust. So that's the first tip. Use um, Anki for the definitions in math lectures. Number two, so whenever you're doing a math class like physics, calculus, economics, whatever it is, formulas are especially good because much like definitions, formulas, formulas are the foundation of math. I know you may be thinking, but I don't need to memorize formulas. They let me use cheat sheets. And while that may be true, I think you having a concrete understanding of the formula in your head, like for example, right now, I know cross price elasticity like the back of my hand. I know income elasticity like the back of my hand. By knowing these things, it actually solidifies your understanding. So even if you do get a cheat sheet and on the day of you use the cheat sheet to remember the formula, by doing the flashcard, you're actually gonna work through like, okay, what does income elasticity mean? How is it defined? Oh, income elasticity is defined as the change that is gonna be demanded for a certain raise uh, in my income, right? And by doing this, if you'll see right here, I've actually included 
the change in demand over the change in income? And I included the answer. And by doing that, I say, okay, that's interesting. Why do we care about this? We care about it because people's incomes change all the time. So as my income changes, obviously I'm going to be more willing to pay for something. So my demand for something may go up, right? So by physically saying these definitions and memorizing these formulas in my head, I'm not just memorizing useless information. I'm actually memorizing the conceptual basis, which I told you was the reoccurring theme for each of these tips. All right. The third question, the third tip I have is oftentimes I know I told you not to use specific math problems. Like don't ask yourself five times five with a flashcard. It would be really silly because you'd kind of just be um, doing something in your head that shouldn't require memorization because it's conceptual. But when you do ask questions for Anki uh, with math, sometimes binary questions are actually really good because math, again, can be very open-ended. And so sometimes giving a very open-ended answer for math is not worth not going to help you. So you want to give binary questions. So for example, um, one of the questions in econ was when taxes are imposed, both buyers and sellers pay. And so which one pays more? And that often depends on the, um, the amount of demand there is. So by having a binary question, you can often say which one pays a bigger role, this or this, right? What's more important, acceleration or velocity? And by having binary questions in that, you actually can make it much easier for you to kind of have a very elucidated answer and say, oh, interesting. I know exactly what the answer is because there's only two options, right? And so it makes it easier to do those flashcards and you're not wasting as much time with open-endedness because math can be very open-ended sometimes. All right, next up, multiple answer flashcards are possible, but if you're specific, okay? And this is, again, based entirely off of conceptual basics, right? So, for example, if there were five assumptions that go into a particular theory, or maybe there are three laws that you have to remember for Newton, Newton's first law, Newton's second law, Newton's third law, or maybe there's um, four laws of electricity and magnetism that you need to remember, then you can actually put them into Anki as one whole thing because those all go together, right? So for me, in econ, there were five assumptions that went into defining perfect competition. Uh, what is perfect competition? It's when you have, you know, buyers don't influence price, sellers don't influence price. The, there's, it's a, it's a undifferentiated product. So each of these things were things that I needed to know, because going into the final, we were going to be tested on perfect competition. So you'll see here that I included all five of the requirements of perfect competition, and then included obviously a uh, answer to it. But as I said, sometimes it's better to group things together like Newton's three laws or the four laws of electricity and magnetism because then you actually have them all in one place. Come test time, you're going to be ready to go and hammer all of that home. And I saved the best tip for last. In math flashcards, ask yourself conceptually tough questions without the math that test your understanding of the math. And this is very tough to explain unless I give you examples, but this is the most important tip. If you get nothing else out of this video, please remember this tip because if you use this tip, it can work wonders for math classes because even without knowing the math, you'll become a badass at the math. And that's like inception, right? And so what do I mean by this? So for example, here's a example question from my um, investing class. I ask, do stocks with a higher market to book value ratio give better returns or lower returns um, compared to stocks with lower um, market to book ratios, right? So notice how this is a conceptual question, but it still tests my quantitative understanding of a ratio. So it's kind of similar. Like sometimes you will realize that even though math is very quantitative, there's a lot of qualitative aspects behind it. For example, you I might ask you, this one has a velocity of 5, this one has a velocity of 10, this one has an acceleration of 2, this one has an acceleration of 4, um, which one qualitatively will increase velocity faster, right? By going through that exercise in your head, it's a qualitative question that I asked you, which one increases velocity faster? It's going to be the one with higher acceleration, right? But by going through the exercise, you're saying, oh, wow, we're seeing these numbers, and I'm actually going to have to say, oh, because acceleration is the derivative of velocity, this one is the one where uh, velocity is moving faster. Similarly here, the whole point was for me to say, what does this ratio mean? Does this higher ratio give a higher return? No, maybe it doesn't. What, why exactly is that? So now you'll see that I actually then explain this. I say, the um, higher the ratio, it implies that the market value is greater than the book value and the share is overvalued and will give low returns, right? So to understand this question, 
I still need to understand the math, and you'll see that the math is actually included below, right? Where higher um, ratios actually give lower returns and lower ratios give higher returns. But through this conceptual question, I am understanding the math, right? So now here's a second example. Uh, again, this is a flashcard that I'm using in my investing class, but notice the question here is what is the alpha in the last column and why is it exactly equal to the average return? So in the last column, you'll see that the average return is 8.4%. And you'll see that the alpha is also 8.4%. So the question I asked myself through this flashcard is, why are those two equal? Again, this is a math-like problem, but notice how it's conceptually asked. I'm asking, why are those two numbers the same? I'm not asking you how you get to those numbers. I'm asking you, why are they the same? And by going through this, I'm like, oh, what does alpha mean again? Oh, what does average return mean again? Why are those two, why did those two have to be the same? And then when I do that, you'll see that the answer here is because the beta is zero. This is, you don't need to understand the mechanics, just know that if you were investing, this would make sense because the formula is such that alpha um, is equal to average return if beta is zero. So by going through this and I'm like, oh, okay, beta is zero. That's why alpha is equal to the average return. I get it. Okay, so I can do one more example with you guys. Um, notice that, again, I'm asking a conceptual question here. I'm saying, what does the 8.4% in the table below imply? What does the alpha value, this value, imply? And again, I have to think to myself, what does alpha mean? Oh, alpha is the difference between the actual return and the theoretical return. And so the 8.4 probably means that I'm getting 8.4 more in reality than is predicted by the model. And just by going through that, I'm, I'm showing myself I know the formula, I'm showing myself I know how to derive alpha, I'm showing myself that if I was given um, a particular return, I would be able to calculate alpha from it, right? So through these conceptual questions, I am understanding math. And this is what I mean by you don't have to um, you may think flashcards are not used for every subject, but they can be because you just have to know how to ask your questions in the right way, right? So with that being said, I hope this video was helpful for you guys. If it was, drop a like, comment, share, subscribe. Let me know what other classes you're interested in me showing you how to use Augie for because this, this tool is impressive. And I promise you I've used flashcards for all my life. They have paid immense dividends. Um, I've gotten mostly A's, exceptional grades. So I really want to make sure you guys use these appropriately because they can be really helpful. All right. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.